last week, we began to look at the importance of focus. Particularly when it comes to following Christ. We looked at the epic sermon of Christ called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, where Jesus calls his disciples to keep their focus on him. They were to refocus their motivations on pleasing God, not on being seen by men. They were to refocus their treasure seeking on eternal treasure, not on the treasures of the here and now. They were to refocus their concerns or anxieties upon submission to Christ, obedience to his commands, cultivation of his character, and not upon clothes, shelter, food, or the meeting of their material needs. If they'd refocus, if Christ was placed first and foremost in their life, their number one pursuit, then Christ promised the Father's blessing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then, and only then, all these things will be added unto you. So how did you do this past week? Did you refocus? Did you persistently plead? I'm talking about you. This past week, did you persistently plead, Lord, help me stay focused, prone to wonder, Lord, help me? Did your mornings prioritize his word and the desperate need that you have of being spirit-filled? How'd you do? Right, you do know that the blessing does not come from hearing, right? The blessing comes from hearing and, let's say it together, hearing and doing. How'd you do this past week? Did you work overtime in pursuit of obeying Christ's commands? Or in pursuit of a bigger paycheck? Or some other manifestation of lesser things did you lead your family this week to prioritize Christ through family worship did you how many times what night when in the night through Christian service where did you serve how did you serve who did you bless at work Or through united prayer. With whom did you pray this week? Your family? Your spouse? Your children? Your small group? How did you refocus? Or did you refocus? Listen to the reflection of Alexander Graham Bell, the great inventor, who wisely noted, and I quote, the sun's rays do not burn until brought to focus. What are you focused on? Do, do, do you yet understand the power and influence of your focus? Or are you living in denial of it? 
Today, our text will continue to call us to refocus. And our text is very similar to the text last week in this sense. Christ, again, is the teacher. His audience is, again, his disciples. But we must note, someone's missing. One of the twelve, Judas, has departed. He left the other disciples in the upper room, having found an opportunity to betray Jesus as Jesus and the disciples head to the garden. According to chapter 14, verse 30, they've left the upper room. And we know from the subsequent events that they are en route to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Christ will pray before his passion, his crucifixion. This is the night before Christ's death. Let's listen in again on their conversation and let's take note as we eavesdrop on how it is once again that Christ calls his disciples to refocus. Pick up with me in John 15 verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman, the vine dresser, the farmer. Now, this does not grab our ears provocatively, because last I checked, there aren't many of us who are Jews. But to a Jewish audience, this was quite a claim. Because from a Jewish perspective, or we can say this, from an Old Testament perspective, everyone knew who the vine was. Everyone knew consistently in the prophets who the source of life was. Everyone knew who you needed to be identified with if you desired God's blessing. And the vine consistently in the Old Testament was national Israel. Listen to the words of Jeremiah 2.21, where he says, concerning Israel, I planted you a choice vine. Listen to the psalmist. This is the Jewish hymn book. Listen to this song and what it says about Israel being the vine, this song, as it rehearses Israel's history using vine metaphors. Psalm 80, verse 8 through 11. You, God, brought a vine out of Egypt. Who did God bring out of Egypt? Israel. You drove out the nations and you planted it. Where did God plant the vine? In the new Eden, the land of promise. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and it filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The mighty cedars with its branches. As the psalmist rejoices in the prosperity of Israel under the reign of David and Solomon. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the great Nile River. So again, although you're not Jewish, for a moment, try to be. Jesus is here claiming to be what the Pharisees had thought their ethnic identity granted them. He was, he is the one and only source of life. He was the reality to which Israel pointed to. He was the fulfillment of the ancient promise. You say, well, what does this matter to me? Do you want life? Do you want to live? You say, well, really, I'd like a pay raise. No, no, I didn't ask that. Do you want to live? I could use another week's vacation. I didn't ask that. Do you want to live? Well, I'm single and I like a spouse. Do you want to live? Yes, I, I want to be physically healed. No, do you want to live? Life is more than all of that. 
Do you want your soul to flourish? And I think every being on this planet would answer to that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm desperate to flourish. Look to Jesus. He's the vine. He's the source of life. He's everything you need. <coughs> everything else is in the category of false vines. Your job's a false vine. Will never make you flourish. Do you know there's coming a day where I will no longer pastor this church? There's coming a day. I'll be a bygone memory. Because this church will flourish without, I'm not the vine. And this church will never satisfy me. My work cannot be the vine. Do you know my spouse? Who I think is a dandy. But do you know she's not the vine? Talk to my children when she's in a bad mood. She's not the vine. If, if I'm looking to a false vine to satisfy me, do you know how hard it would be for her to be married to someone who expects from her what she is unable to provide? You understand that that's often one of the deepest problems in a relationship. We are looking to the horizontal partner to provide for our soul what only Christ can give. Well, I'm not happy, and we blame them. When Jesus says, they're not divine, they're not big enough, they're not strong enough, they're not God, I am, look to me. Work's not divine, your spouse isn't divine. Do you know children? Our false vines. Pastor Hack and I, Brother Ken, we could tell you so many children grow up. And that which what once brought temporary life to a mom and a dad forgets mom and dad, neglects mom and dad is ungrateful towards mom and dad, yea, even tragically wants nothing to do with mom and dad, but take heart. There is a vine. Jesus. Our economy is not the vine. Can, can I repeat that? Our economy is not the vine. This nation, can I say this to any great patriot? This nation is not the vine. Christ is the vine. So can you hear the frustration of God through the prophet of Jeremiah when he says, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. It's a change of metaphors. I'm the fountain of life-giving water. And they have heaped out for themselves cisterns, rain buckets, but they're broken and they can hold no water. Are you focused on the vine? Or is it the new season of fill in the blank with your favorite Netflix or weekly show? Is your life turned upside down because your vine that was the Colts laid an egg? <laughs> or are you today unfazed because the Colts are not, never have been, and never will be your vine because your vine is King Jesus who always wins, amen? <laughs> or, 
different. What is God calling his disciples to refocus on? He's about to say to them farewell. And he leaves them with such a powerful picture to ponder. I am the vine. Look at me. Seek me. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood. Get all of me that you can get. But the focus isn't just upon the son's identity as the vine. Notice also something that we tend to pass or gloss over. The father's identity as the farmer. And all the green-thumbed Hoosiers should say, Amen. God elevates the dignity of earth tilling. He's the husbandman. He's the vine dresser. Christ is the source of life. And the Father stands apart from Christ. And the Father, in all his sovereign power, is focused on one thing preeminently, preeminently focused on what? You? Nope. He cares about the divine, preeminently. That's not to say that he doesn't care about you, but I'm talking about preeminently. First and foremost, who is the father? Just entranced with the vine. This is going to be his grand champion at the fair. Why does the father do what the father does? The father wants to both glorify himself and he wants to glorify the vine. The father is at work so that all would see the vine and say, amazing. And that all would look at him and the way in which through history he has tended to, planted, and caused to flourish this vine. God is for God. Preeminently. So the Father's identity, he is the sovereign one. Who tends to the vine and who functions as judge. In some sense, in this metaphor, so let's keep reading. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch, by ellipsis, in me that bears fruit, he prunes or he purges or he cleanses it that it might bring forth more fruit. So in verse 2, what does Jesus want us to focus on? In verse 2, it's the work of the Father as the vine dresser. And so there are two works of the Father as he is enraptured with the vine. Work number one is a work of judgment. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. He, he severs the insincere attachment to Jesus. Now, let's skip down to verse 6 to see the full picture. If a man abide not in me, not only is he taken away, but look at this, he is cast forth as a branch, he withers, that is the opposite of flourishing, that is, that is death. And then men gather them, all of the cast off false branches, and they are thrown into a pile, and they are burned. And then, that's work number one of the Father. It's a work of judgment. Work number two 
is a work of pruning, and that work is done to all the fruit-bearing vines. Now, the question that we need to answer this morning is this. What is happening to the unfruitful branches, and who are they? So, so first, what's happening to them, and then, who are they? And we're being called to focus upon this work of the Father. This is either supposed to encourage us, this is to frighten us, this is to constrain or control or influence us, understanding the work of the Father. It will enhance our relationship to the vine. So what's going to happen to these branches that are, quote, in Christ, yet they are unfruitful? Well, in the metaphor, they're cut off the vine. They are cast collectively together, and they are burned. Hold your place in John chapter 15, and I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 13. Remember, when you're studying the Scripture, the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. So go to Matthew chapter 13. This is another metaphor, teaching of Jesus, and, and he's very clear, and he uses some of the same imagery, and I think from Matthew 13, we can find some clarity. What's happening here? Matthew chapter 13, I want to call your attention to verse 37. Actually, I'm calling your attention to verse 24. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a man which sowed good seed in his field. And while men slept, his servants slept, his enemy came and sowed bad seed, false wheat, tares among the wheat. And then he went his way. And when the blades sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares. So the servants of the farmer come, and they say to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in the field? Uh, where did these weeds come from, these tares? And he said unto them, An enemy's done this. And the servant says, Okay, okay, what do we do? do? Do we go and gather them up? And he said, No, 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 stop, stop, stop. I don't want you to gather up the weeds, the tares, because I'm concerned about the true wheat. I don't want you to root up the true wheat. So look at verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, look what happens. I will say to the reapers, gather ye together, first the tares, gather the tares. There is a taking up and a taking away of the tares. In eschatology, what gets taken up, taken away, cast out, burned? Not believers. Always false disciples. Bind them into bundles and burn them. What happens, though, to the wheat? Gather them to my barn. They will dwell with the husbandman. What is he referencing? Well, look at verse 49 of this same chapter, Matthew 13. He switches the metaphor, the kingdom of heaven is like to a net cast into the sea, and it gathers all sorts of things from the sea. And when the net's full, they draw it to shore, and they sit down, and they, 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 they sort through it. They, they, they take what's good, but what do they do with the bad? The, the, the good is always gathered to, and the bad is always cast away. And look at verse 49, so shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay, I, I believe that biblically, we can know with certainty the work of the Father is work of judgment. He, he takes anyone who is insincerely, falsely, a disciple of Jesus, 
and in judgment, he severs them from Jesus, he casts them away from Jesus, and then he judges them in his wrath. The next question that we have to answer is this, okay? Uh, all right, that's what happens, but who are these people? Because this is what is potentially put in jeopardy. Are these individuals believers? Are these, are these individuals believers, followers of Jesus who are just unfruitful? Here's a term we throw around in church a lot, backsliding. Are these unfruitful or backslidden believers that lose or forfeit their salvation? Are these, are these individuals who are adopted into God's family, but based upon their lack of obedience, they are then divorced from God's family? And a lot of people get hung up in verse 2. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Verse 6, if a man not, abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Is this teaching that there is no security for the believer? Is this teaching that one can lose their salvation or that one must work diligently to merit and service and maintain their salvation? Well, the answer to that idea is categorically no. But let me show you from the text. Go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And as you're learning, as you're turning there in John chapter 6, Jesus is again teaching. And he is confronting unbelievers start in verse 36 but I said unto you you also have seen me and you believe not but notice what he says in verse 37 all that the father gives me will come to me and him who comes to me I will in no wise what cast out praise God for the security of the believer but follow the progression. All whom the Father gives to the Son. The Father has a people. The Father has a people. A people who he foreknew. A people who he predestined. God's elect. The Father has a people. The Father gives those people to the Son. And Jesus says this. Everyone who's been given to me, when they hear my voice, my sheep, follow all that the Father has given to me, they will come to me. And him who comes to me, I will not cast out. But he goes further. Verse 38. I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will who has sent me, that all which he has given me, I should lose nothing. How many of his children does the Father lose? None. How many of his children does the son lose? None. None get lost in the great transfer. There is security for the believer. And the security is secured not by our performance. The security is secured by God. The Father and the Son. The work of the Spirit. But should raise it up again in the last day. That's John 6. Now, flip forward to John 10. Flip forward to John 10. I just want to show you one more time. John 10. And I want you to look here at verse 25. And notice it's a similar context. Jesus is addressing a group of people who do not believe on him. He's providing insight into their rejection. Then came around about him some Jews, and they said unto him, How long... Do you make us doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answers them in verse 25 of chapter 10. I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not because you are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, 
my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them what type of life? If you're there in the text, say it with me. I give unto them eternal life, and eternal life couldn't be eternal if you ever could lose it. I give to them eternal life, and they shall, say it with me if you're reading there, never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave to me, he's greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand because I and my Father are one. And then they want to stone him. Okay, we got to get back to the text. Whoever these branches are, that are quote unquote in the vine, but they're not bearing fruit, they cannot be truly believers. For believers would never be cast out, gathered, and burned. Now, here's what you need to know all throughout the Gospel of John there's a portrayal of true and false disciples all throughout the Gospel. Start with me in chapter 2. Just turn real quick, chapter 2. John chapter 2. I want you to look with me. I want you to look at verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem with Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw his miracles, which he did. So how many believers are there? Many believers, many quote-unquote believers. But notice this, Jesus doesn't commit himself unto them. Why? He knows them. He knows them. He discerns beyond mere external professions. He knows the reality of the heart. Verse 25, he need not that any man testify concerning someone else, for he knew what was in man. Go to chapter 6. Flip there. Look, look quickly at verse 64. There are some of you that believe not. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to people who are, quote, unquote, attached to him. And he says this, there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Amongst the immediate branches of the 12 apostles, does Jesus and the Father both know who's real and who's not? John discloses to us that Jesus from the very beginning knew, Jesus, knew Judas was false. From the beginning he knew Judas was false. And what happens to Judas? There's an act of judgment and he is severed. And the reality of his false identity is made clear to all in his act of great betrayal. Look at verse 66 of that same chapter. From that time, many of his disciples, they're quote-unquote disciples, but they went back and they walk no more with him. Now go with me to chapter 8. Just real quickly, I'm belaboring it, but I want you to know that the interpretation of not of this text that we're in today is not up for debate. John 8, look with me at verse 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to the Jews which believed on him. And notice what he says. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples truly. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Again, there's this play, true disciples false disciples. Go to John 13, last, last little text. John 13, I think I will have convinced you, or at least you'll be saying in your, in, in, in your mind, move on, good man, move on. John 13, 10. This is in the context of foot washing. Jesus is rebuking Peter, who did not want Christ to wash his feet. Jesus says to Peter, he that is washed needs not save to wash his feet, but is clean in every way. And you are clean, but not all. And look at the explanation of verse 11. For Jesus knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. And I think to that great text from last week, 
Many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, to whom the Father will say, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. But what do we need to be focusing on? Jesus is the vine. What do we need to be focusing on? The Father is committed to a work, and the first is a work of judgment. He knows the heart, and he will sever, and he will judge, and he will burn. All insincerely connected to the vine. How do we respond? Well, on one hand, there's fear. Lord, is it I? On the other hand, there is an understanding and a thick skin when there are inevitable departures. Do not be undone when someone within our covenant community departs from the covenant community. And I'm not talking about going from one Bible-believing church to another Bible-believing church. That just happens in America. I'm talking about someone who was a Christian, but now they don't even claim to believe. Don't be undone by that. In that moment, understand this is the work of the Father. It is the work of the Father in time to sever all false branches from the vine. And when the church is going through persecution, take heart, every Judas gets his. And sometimes you have to read the Bible from a different cultural context. Imagine you're in the persecuted underground church of China, and you've got a gut-level suspicion that one of your brothers is false. He's a plant. He's a narc, he's a squealer, he's a spy. And maybe you are personally undone by his acts of betrayal. You take heart, the Father will take care of all false branches. But let's go back, because that's not the only thing that we want to focus on. Hopefully that's not you. But hopefully that truth encourages you to persevere. Look what it says next. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, he purges, he cleans it so that it might be even more fruitful. This is the work of the Father. And this is painful work. No discipline for the moment seems... To be pleasant. Isn't that what the author of Hebrews says? Physical training is hard. January gym members, physical training is hard. No one's figured out how to remove that. The difficulty of physical training, it's hard. Dieting's hard. Any type of discipline, daily Bible reading, hard. Daily prayer, hard. Discipline's hard. But discipline is good. Suffering is hard. Cancer's hard. Divorce is hard. Family trials, rebellious teenagers, hard. Getting laid off, hard. Struggling with discouragement, hard. Struggling with sin, hard. But suffering. When do we feel closest to God? Normally, in our darkest moments of absolute brokenness, which forces us to draw near. Take heart. There are some who right now, 2018, you say, stop it, God, I can't take any more pruning. Friend, be encouraged. The fact that he prunes you is evidence that he loves you. And he's committed to something. He's committed to your fruit bearing. He's committed to strengthening your connection to the vine. He's committed to working in such a way that your greater joys come from Christ, your greater peace comes from Christ. He's helping you turn away from all false saviors. 
He's causing you to delight in what we ought to delight in apart from any sort of external stimuli, but we often are unwilling to delight in because we're so distracted by flashy things. Are you feeling me? This is the work of the Father. Now, what does any of this have to do with our theme of refocusing? Severing false disciples, it's not your work. Pruning other Christians, it's not your work, ultimately. Christ's work is to give you life. The Father's work is to direct you to focus on the life giver so that you might bear fruit. So what's your job? Stay focused. Are you feeling that? What do you need to do this year? You need to stay focused. On what? Jesus. Submission to Jesus. Make it your number one goal. The teachings of Jesus make obedience your number one priority. Now look at verse 3. Already or now, you are clean through the word I have spoken to you. Now, I want to cultivate this, and, and I'm winding down. I'll, I'll cover the next several verses quickly. I'm only going to verse 11, and I'm going to move very rapidly here in a moment. We really had to spend the labor in the first couple of verses. Now, he's talking experientially. He wants to know. He wants these 11 to know. I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't you after you've been warned, Jesus is the vine, but here's what the Father's going to do. He's going to cut out some, burn them, and he's going to prune others. Aren't you sitting there in the moment after that blow has been like dealt to you, and you're like, which am I? And so what does Jesus do for the 11, all of which have remained with him? Remaining is another word for abiding, all of which have abided. What does Jesus say? He encourages them and he says this, now you are, the English word clean is actually, in my personal perspective, it's an unfortunate translation. Because it's the same Greek word that is translated in its verbal form as pruning or purging. Now you are pruned, you are purged. It's just, it's just the noun form. You are purged, pruned, through the word which I have spoken unto you. He, he gives assurance to these 11. You're, you're mine. Now, here's what's important. Not just the reality that they are his, but the how because I want to minister some encouragement to you. I want you to walk away and hopefully be encouraged. I am his. I'm a vine that the Father's committed to pruning so that I can bring forth more fruit, more glory to him, so that my joy can be full. That's me. Well, how, how does anyone become that? What was the means of their pruning? Jesus said, the word. You are clean through what? The word. I've spoken to you. These 11 were individuals who heard the words of Jesus and they submitted to the words of Jesus. They heard the words of Jesus and according to John 1, 12, they received the Son and whoever receives the Son becomes a son. Amen? How did you become a true vine branch? How did you develop an authentic connection to Jesus? You developed it by faith. You developed it. Could I use it this way? By focusing on the word and receiving it into your soul. Making it 
your own. From a human responsibility perspective, this is what you did. Now, here's what he's going to argue for. The way into Christ is also the way to bear fruit for Christ. Maintain your focus. Keep your eyes on my word. Keep your, your, your heart submitted to my son. Look to him as the giver of life. Look to him as your greatest need. That's what brought you in, and that's what will keep and cause you to be fruitful. And that's where he goes in verse 4. Abide in me. Remain in me. What you did in verse 3, keep doing it. And here's my commitment. I'll remain in you. Because a branch can't bear fruit of itself unless it remains in the vine. And you cannot bear fruit unless you abide in the vine. And I want to pause here and say this. I close my sermon with truths that only appeal to a regenerated soul. If you are not a Christian, this will have no power over you. But if you are a Christian, this will rule you. You see, what happens in the new birth, you receive a new heart. And this new heart that you receive has a deep and unexplainable desire to glorify the Father. I'm not standing here today seeking to argue to anyone that somehow glorifying the Father is experientially superior to any of the other worldly pleasures, although I believe that to be true. But that's not the point that I'm arguing from. I'm saying this. If you're a child of God, you have an unexplainable desire. The love of Christ constrains you. You have a heart that wants to please him. You want him to receive glory because of the reality of all that he's done for you. You actually want to live not for yourself, but for him who called you and gave himself for you. You want to decrease and you want him to increase. That truth is in you. It's, it's imparted to you by the spirit. It's part of the new man. This is what you want. And so I'm saying this to you, believer. How do you get more of what you want? How do you this year Glorify God more in your marriage, in your parenting, in your workplace. How do you glorify God more in your church membership? How do you glorify God more in your service to your community? How do you increase your fruit-bearing load? You stay focused on the vine. Believing him to be the source of life, he alone will make you flourish. Flourishing often looks different than what you first desired. You are very careful to listen to his words. And you seek to obey and submit to them. It is through that focus, that is your end, sanctification is synergistic. God does his part, you do your part. Your job is to abide. Abide is stated, that command, ten times in this passage. That's a lot. Look at verse 5. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing, friend. You can do no activity that brings glory to God apart from the indwelling and empowering of Jesus. And if you're a Christian, that's something you want to do. Now, for sake of time, let me jump to verse 11 and close with this. There's much more I'd like to say, but my time's run out. Verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Wow. Wow. Now, I believe that no matter who you are today, you might be interested in this. Do you want 2019 to be a year where regardless what happens externally, that internally in your inner man, you are filled with joy? Do you want that this year? 
that you could say like Paul, though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day. Do you want that this year? Do you want to have a completely secure joy that, that nothing can rob you of? I mean, your health can't rob you of this joy. The people around you can't rob you of this joy. The economy can't rob you of this joy. Your church can't rob you of this joy. I can't rob you of this joy. Do you want a completely secure and unparalleled joy? Because it's not just your joy being full. What Jesus is saying here, my joy, the incomprehensible joy of the infinite God in me, which causes my joy to be full. Do you want that this year? And I would say, yes. Where do I write the check? What class do I sign up for? Who's going to be my personal trainer to help me obtain it? And Jesus says to his disciples before he departs, you want joy? Stay focused. His kingdom his righteousness. And the Father will prune. He's sovereign. And he will grant you your prayers. Because the focus and the words of Christ dwelling in you cause you to want one main thing. You want his glory. You want his joy, you want his love, you begin to pray for these things, and he will grant you these things. Juliana Wiseman is not here today. She can't get out normally in weather like this. But as I thought of this sermon, I couldn't help but think, of her husband, who's now with the Lord, Bud. Bud loved landscaping. I remember back when I lived in the meadows on Cerulean Drive. We had shortly arrived here at the church. We had an open house, and some of you who were back in the church then, you came to the open house because we just wanted you to know where we lived, and this is kind of how we lived, and we, we wanted you to feel comfortable in our home. So we had this big open house, and I remember Bud came to my open house, and I remember, I didn't know him very well, but he made fun of me. <laughs> and here's good old buddy, he liked to rib people, here's good old buddy, he's making fun of me. And you know why he's making fun of me? He walks to my back porch. Now, I'm sure that there were women who walked into the house, and they're judging my wife's decorating skills, and my wife's a great decorator. And I'm sure that there were others who like things to be clean, and they're wondering whether or not we cleaned up for guests, and certainly we did. But Bud didn't care about the cleanliness. He didn't care about the decor. He cared about one thing. He went to the back porch. He looked out in the backyard. I had just mowed it. I only had a push mower at that time. And it looked like I had mowed the lawn a wee bit tipsy. <laughs> My lines were not straight. He never would let go of that. <laughs> when Bud was in the hospital, preparing to meet the Lord, and I had a chance to go back and visit with him, he ribbed me again <laughs> about my lawn mowing skill, or lack thereof. Now watch this. Although it wasn't evidenced on that particular day when I cut the lawn, I know this. There's one key to straight lines. It's focus. Not looking at the close and immediate, but looking beyond. Fixing your eyes on a point. Not diverting your attention from that point. And if you stay fixed on that point that is distant yet ahead, you will mow much straighter than if you're staring at your tires. And I thought, the Christian life isn't much different. 2019, I don't want it to be this. Individually, for my family or for the church, I don't want it to be this. What are we chasing now as a church? One thing. 
His name is Jesus. We want his kingdom, his rule over our heart. We want his righteousness cultivated within us. We want eternal treasures. We want to bring him glory. We crave his joy, a superior joy. Therefore, we do one thing. We stay focused. Let's close in prayer and ask for God's grace to help this week. Father, I believe that there are some in our midst that if they stay on their current trajectory one day, maybe right now it's a teenager sitting in this auditorium, one day if they stay in the same trajectory, God the Father as an act of judgment, will remove their insincere connection from Christ. It'll be apparent to all that they are not Christ. They will be judged and they will be damned. And Lord, I believe that those individuals, they know this reality. They suppress the truth of this reality. Because if they were to look at the lack of fruit in their life. There's no passion for God's glory. There's no deep submission to Jesus. There's no craving of obedience. Lord, there's, there's, a, there's a deep affection for false vines and they just happen to come to church or perhaps come sporadically. I pray that you would grant them repentance that they would realize the pathway to being a sincere branch is heartfelt reception of the words and person of Christ. He is Lord, and their knee must bow, and their tongue must confess, and they must lay down their rebellion and seek to honor him. They must look to him for a new heart that only he will give through repentance and faith. I pray today that there would be some, even as we close, who would repent and miraculously be connected to the vine. I pray for this, Father. And yet, I pray at the same time, for the, for the majority, I hope, I hope, the majority who have been made clean by your word, already pruned, and yet, living out that reality in the here and now. And some have been struggling with what your pruning has brought them. Oh, I pray that you would awaken their faith, that they would trust deeply that the work of, of, of providential suffering in their life is good and it's, it's pointing them to joy in Christ. And I pray that they would joy in Christ. And for others... They would just stay focused. Christ above all things. At work, at home, at play. Christ, Christ, Christ. Grant us this grace. You said that if we would pray in this way, you would grant us our requests. Therefore, we hold you to your word, Father. Bless us now as we contemplate these things and then sing. Bless us as we journey home in Christ's name.